So everyone, in this video, we're going to talk about sciatica. We're going to dive into some of the key anatomy of the sciatic nerve. What are the key symptoms we need to look out for to diagnose it? And what are some of the common treatment strategies to help our patients in practice? If you're ready to learn, let's dive in. Hey everyone, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. Let's dive into sciatica, starting with some of the key anatomy. So the sciatic nerve is said to be the longest nerve in our body. We can see how it runs all the way down from the lumbar spine, where it originates from the ventral rami of the nerve roots of L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3. So there's a really large nerve supply that creates the sciatic nerve, but also keep an eye on those nerve roots, L4, L5, S1, S2, S3. This becomes really important later when we talk about our testing and what we expect from myotomes and dermatomes. So these nerve roots bundle together to create the sciatic nerve. And we can see that the sciatic nerve exits the pelvis at the greater sciatic foramen underneath the sciatic notch around the pelvis. It then travels underneath the piriformis muscle and down the back of the thigh, where it splits at the knee into the common perineal nerve and the tibial nerve. This is also really, really important when we think about some of the signs and symptoms for our sciatica patients. So, crucial things to summarize from the anatomy. Nerve roots, L4, L5, S1, S2, S3 runs down the back of the posterior thigh and splits around the knee into the tibial nerve and the common perineal nerve. Why does this matter? Let's go through the clinical signs. Okay, so what are the key signs and symptoms we expect our patients with sciatica to present with? First of all, we're going to talk about sciatica in its mild to moderate form. Here, we expect patients to present with pain that runs down the posterior aspect of the leg. As we saw, this is where the sciatic nerve runs down the posterior thigh, but we also expect patients with sciatica to present with pain that runs below the knee. We saw in the anatomy that the sciatic nerve splits into the tibial nerve and the common perineal nerve, both of which run down the posterior and lateral aspects of the leg. Therefore, it would make sense that patients who have sciatica will present with pain that runs down and past the knee because the nerves that break off from the sciatic nerve also run down and past the knee. Another really key crucial point about sciatica is that patients often describe that their leg pain is worse than their back pain. So you'll find that patients say that their pain around their back might be a five or a six out of 10. However, their leg pain, that's really irritable. That's up to a seven, an eight or a nine out of 10 because it's really, really sharp. What kind of sensation do patients talk about when they have sciatica? Well, we know that this is a nerve-based problem and therefore they report nerve-based descriptions such as a sharp pain, a shooting pain, a burning pain, an electrical pain, or a lancinating pain running down the back of the leg. All different descriptors that we expect for patients with sciatica. Now, many patients with sciatica will also present with positive neurodynamic tests. Now, when it comes to the sciatic nerve, here we think about the slump test and the straight leg raise test. So the slump test, I'm sure you've seen this before, where you have your patients sitting on the edge of the bed. We ask them to flex their spine and we ask them to bring their leg up, which is assisted by the examiner. And then we dorsiflex the foot to see whether or not it recreates this shooting pain down the back of the leg. We also have the passive straight leg raise test. This is where we have our patient lying supine and the therapist passively lifts the patient's leg up into the air with a passive straight leg raise. Once the patient's pain is sensitized, we then add in dorsiflexion to see if it reproduces our patient's pain down the back of the leg. Once again, we're looking for the reproduction of symptoms down the back of the leg, as we saw in the anatomy, that's where the sciatic nerve runs. And we know that those two tests are the ones that are biased towards the sciatic nerve in particular. If you have a positive on either, where it reproduces the patient's symptoms on the affected side, but not on the unaffected side, that would be a positive indication for sciatica. 
Okay, what about in more advanced cases of sciatica, where our patient has a significant nerve root compression that could be caused by a herniated disc, for example? Here, we expect our patients to present with signs of a radiculopathy. And there are three key signs of a radiculopathy, which are myotomal changes, dermatomal changes, and reflex changes. And in particular, we're looking for a loss in one or more of those three. A loss in power, which would represent a loss in myotomal strength, a loss in sensation, which would represent a loss in dermatomal sensation, or a loss of reflex, hyporeflexia, a loss or absence of patient reflexes. So what kind of myotomal, dermatomal, or reflex changes might we expect? Well, let's go back to the anatomy. The key nerve roots that supply the sciatic nerve are L4, L5, S1, S2, and S3. Therefore, if we think about myotomes, L4, the main action in the myotome of L4 is ankle dorsiflexion. L5 is big toe extension. S1 is ankle plantar flexion, and S2 is knee flexion. We may get a loss of one or more of those myotomes. When it comes to dermatomal testing, L4 runs along the medial side of the lower leg before running underneath the calcaneus. L5 runs from the lateral fibula across towards the first digit. S1 runs along the lateral side of the foot, so we may see a loss of sensation in one or more of those areas. Reflexes. The key reflex that we associate with the sciatic nerve is the ankle reflex, which tests the reflex at the spinal level S1, S2, as we highlighted, is paired with the sciatic nerve. So that's the ankle reflex, and if we see a loss of ankle reflex hyporeflexia on the painful side compared to the unaffected side, that would also be a potential positive indication of a nerve root pathology of the sciatic nerve. So those are our key clinical signs, and I really hope you can see how the anatomy ties in to those different signs. Let's talk briefly about treatment. Now, there are lots of different research studies that show us that, unfortunately, there is no specific protocol for treating sciatica. What do we find that the guidelines suggest in clinical practice? Well, the key thing in the early stages is to try and help a patient get moving. Whether we do that, with general aerobic activity, such as walking or cycling or swimming, or whether we do that with specific physiotherapy exercises, whether that be lumbar spine range of movement exercises, whether that be gluteal strengthening exercises, the research shows that there's no major difference between the two. Instead, what's more important is number one, that we can provide exercises which are comfortable and tolerable for the patient without overly inflaming their symptoms. And number two, that the activity is meaningful to them because it means that they're more likely to stay in touch with it. So for example, if your patient said that they hated swimming, you wouldn't give swimming as an exercise for them. But if they said they really enjoy swimming, they love swimming, and they find that they can do a little bit of swimming that doesn't aggravate their symptoms, perfect. That's the activity for them. If the patient says that they actually want something specific in terms of exercises, they want to feel like they're doing something prescribed by a physiotherapist, I would be getting my patient on the bed and going through a range of exercises with them to see what works best for you, what's most tolerable for you, and that would be the right answer for them in terms of their rehab. What are some of the common exercises I might suggest to try here? First of all, we can think about a bridge where our patient is gently pushing their bottom in the air and slowly controlling it back down. Or we can think about this cobra lumbar extension position where they're on the floor pushing themselves up either onto their elbows or fully straight with the hands to see if we can increase some lumbar extension. We can do something like a prayer stretch or a child's pose stretch where they're really getting that lumbar flexion but doing so in a position that's more comfortable for them. Or we can think about this pelvic tilt in an all fours position, commonly referred to as cat-cow, as a way of trying to get the pelvis moving in this all four position. Ultimately, the key with any of these exercises is 
what is comfortable for you. Whichever is most comfortable for the patient are the ones I'm going to be giving them to go home with. But as well as exercises and keeping moving, there's so much more that we can do for our patients. One of the key things, of course, is education. Explaining to our patients that it's good to move. It's important to keep moving rather than not doing anything and letting their back stiffen up. It's also important to talk about the fact that hurt does not equal harm, to point out to them that pain is not a sign of damage helping them to understand that movement is good even if it causes a little bit of pain they will be making things better rather than worse. It's important for us to talk to our patient about their concerns what they think is going on and to try and rule out any negative beliefs that might be impacting on their condition or how they're moving and one of the key things that I associate this with is the use of painkillers. As a physiotherapist, I can't prescribe painkillers, but I can advise the patient to go to see their doctor to talk about them, particularly for thinking about specific nerve-based painkillers like amitriptyline, gabapentin, and things like that, which are going to help reduce nerve-specific pain. Once again, I would always be encouraging my patient to go and speak to their GP, speak to their doctor for prescription of those specifically, rather than telling them that they can take them as and when they like. And one final thought that I've been talking about more and more with patients with sciatica is the importance of reducing sensitivity of the nervous system in general. Sciatica is associated with an increase in sensitivity of our nerves. And we find that when we help patients to reduce the sensitivity of their nerves generally and improve their nerve health, they get better outcomes. What does that mean? It means relaxing everything, turning down the volume. That might mean relaxation exercises to help patients relax into their movement. Maybe it's deep breathing exercises or meditation to help try and calm everything down. And another really important factor is sleep and helping the patient get better sleep, which is also really important as to why painkillers matter to help your patient get that sleep. All in all, it's a really wide-based approach to treating sciatica. There isn't a specific protocol that fixes everything, but as therapists, that's where we come in to help our patient and give them something tailored to suit them best. So everyone, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button. It's the number one thing you can do to help our YouTube channel. If you want even more resources from us, please do check out our Instagram account, at Clinical Physio, be sure to give us a follow there. And we have TikTok as well, clinical.physio, be sure to give us a follow there. Now, if you want even more wider, detailed resources, do check out our membership platform, link in the description below, member.clinicalphysio.com. We've got great webinars there, such as low back pain differential diagnosis, lumbar spine red flags, and low back pain treatment and rehab to help you in your clinical practice. Otherwise, my name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.